topic. Um, testing, what, what do we mean by testing? So I'm not going to use any slides really. So I'm going to just talk about a few things. So let's get to, um, get to the topic. Uh, first thing is uh, unit testing. Um, why should we do unit testing? Uh, there are a number of reasons we should do unit testing. And one of the reasons for doing that is it can lead to a better design. Now, how could it lead to a better design? The reason simply is, if you take a piece of code, you're trying to write a unit test on it. So what does the unit test do? It tries to exercise the piece of code and tells us whether the code is doing what we expect it to do. Now imagine this for a minute. If you have a function that is a thousand lines long, have you ever seen a function that's a thousand lines long? Yeah, a few of us. Yeah, I've seen it. Is it good? No. We all know it's bad, but we still have seen it. Nobody here wrote that method, right? Nobody here wrote the long function because we know better. The guys who wrote long functions are still at work today, making them longer. Right? Yeah. So we know not to write long methods. Absolutely. But long methods are bad because why? How do you possibly write? unit test on a long method. Very good. That's the right answer. You cannot. It's impossible to write unit tests on a long method. So what do you end up doing? You end up making the method smaller and smaller and smaller. Hey, what happens if the method becomes small? A long method does a lot of things. A small method does one thing. And it does that one thing very well. Hey, what do we call that thing? Design. We call it cohesion. So small methods become more cohesive. But the other advantage is that small methods don't depend on a lot of things. So they end up being, thank you, loosely coupled. So we end up having high cohesion and loose coupling. Hey, look at what we just did. We started writing test cases on this method, and we ended up with a method that's highly cohesive and loosely couple, which are good design qualities, and that's how unit testing can lead to better design. It helps us to better design the software. It is a safety net when refactoring. What is refactoring? Anybody? Improving the design of the code without modifying the external behavior by improving the internal structure of the code, right? So you're at work, and you say, I want to refactor this code. Or your boss says, what do you do? I refactor it. And how come 20 things that work yesterday don't work anymore? <laughs> and the next time you say refactoring, people will laugh at you. OK, so refactor again, right? <laughs> so we don't want that to happen. So when you have enough unit tests on your code, what happens? You refactor the code, you run your unit test, and if one of them doesn't work or a few of them doesn't work, you say, oops, never mind. Roll back the change from the, from the repository. Take a shot into the game, right? So it's a safety net when it comes to refactoring. That's a huge advantage, right? What else is the benefit? The benefit is, it is, um, do you hear me fine without the uh, microphone? All right, cool. So it, it's a safety net to refactoring. It forms, it is a form of documentation. How is that? You can write documentation on your code. But you know what happens when you write documentation on the code? You change the code, and the documentation is stale. Has it ever happened? And then one day, six months later, you read the documentation, you read the code. <laughs> Which one is right? Do I believe the code, or do I believe the documentation, right? Well, you have a unit test. A unit test never lies. You run the unit test, either it passes or it fails. If it fails, you know it's deviating from the code. Time to either fix the test or fix the code, bam, right there. So it's a way of documenting the code because it tells what the code is supposed to do. Now we could talk about all these wonderful benefits of unit testing, right? We could keep talking about it all day long. But we don't have all day long. So what do we do? 
All right, we are sold. We want to do unit testing. Well, guess what? This is a code on which I want to do unit testing. So I put the baby on the table. We run all the tests we want. No problem, right? So unit testing is easy when the code has no dependencies. But then what happens? You have a piece of code that has several dependencies, right? Imagine I have a piece of code. I am dependent on this one. I'm dependent on this one. I'm dependent on another thing. You come to me and say, I'm going to unit test you. Oh, wait a second. If you want to unit test me, I got to depend on this. And this is unpredictable. I have to depend on that, and that's slow. You make a call on it. I don't know when I'll get the response back. And I depend on this other thing, which is going to require that I clear some security layers. And I got to set this up properly to do it. I'm going to have a database. And I call it twice, it fails, because the data is already there in the database, right? So when you have a code which has dependencies, it is extremely hard to unit test. So what do we normally say? We say, yeah, we don't have time for that. We got work to do. We got deadlines, remember? And our boss is like, what does your boss do when you get to work? Are you done yet? You say, no. He says, I'll check back with you later. And then you just sit down. He's like, are you done yet? <laughs> OK. So you're like, no time for it. Let's get the coding done, right? We don't have time for that. So what happens? You know, it's funny. Companies never have time to do things. Would you agree? Yes. But they always have time to redo it. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. It's like, can I have time for it? No. OK, fine. We ship it. There's 20,000 bugs in it. It doesn't work. It sucks. OK, God, now go fix it. Yes. Hey, where are you coming? I don't know. we got to fix it now because it's released. Right? So it's kind of a weird. Bosses are weird. Anyway, um, so we want to fix this piece of code. We want to unit test it, but there are dependencies. What do we do? So this is where mock objects come in. So you want to unit test, but unit testing is automated unit testing. We want to automate this, bam, run it continuously all the time. So I want my unit test to be fair. So what does fair mean here? I want my unit test to be fast. I want my unit test to be automated. I want my unit test to be isolated. I don't want them to be dependent on each other. And finally, I want my unit test to be repeatable. So I want my unit test to be repeatable, right? So how do we do all of these things? This is where a mock object comes in. So what is a mock object? OK, so you want to make a movie. And you want a good script for a movie. And you got a good script. But you need a real good actor. Who's your favorite actor? Yes, you're the actor? Yeah. No, OK, so who's your favorite actor? That's too quick to say. Too quick? How could it be too quick? Who's the most recent actor you watched? Who was that? Uh, I'm sorry. Amirkar. Amirkar. I don't know who Amirkar is, but I'll take it from you. I don't watch any movies. OK, so we got Amirkar. We have to have him on the movie, right? OK, cool. So what do you do? You call him and say, we got a movie. We got hands full of, you know, full of room here. So we can maybe make a movie with you. But we got to set the stage properly for him, right? Otherwise, it's not going to really look good. So you ask him to come at 9 in the morning to set the stage. What do you think? Like it, right? You might get close to the roof. Because he's going to charge you from 9 o'clock. That's not going to work. So what do you do? You tell him, 3 o'clock, come to the stage, we're going to do the shooting. But you need to set up the stage so that it, it matches him. So what do you do? You drive around the street, and you find a guy about this height and weight. And you go to him and say, he looks like a car. And the guy's melted up, right? He's really? And you turn around this way. Oh my goodness, he looks just like him. And that's it. You buy him, you know, one idli and one dosa, and he's willing to stand there the entire day, right? <laughs> and you tell him he can be seen a man at the end of the day. That's it. He says, I'll work for free. Now you know what a mock object is. A mock object is an object that will stand in for the real object. How good this mock object should be? Not good at all. If it was good, you made a mock for that again, right? So it should be really dumb that you can just place and say, just stand here, he stands. You say, turn around, he turns around. He has no skills. He just sits there to help you get your work done. And then when the work is done, you say, thank you for standing here. Now step away. And you can bring the man and get the work done, right? So that is a mock object. What can a mock object do for you? It can simulate behavior. But not only can a mock object simulate behavior, a mock object can also simulate ill behavior. Why do I care about 
your ill behavior. You say, okay, here's my order processing system, and what does my order processing system do? He charges my credit card using what? Using his or, you know, payment processing system. But his payment processing system is rock solid. It never crashes. My order processing system, my requirement says, it should gracefully handle if the order process, the payment processing system goes down. How do I test for it? I can give him some money. Look at the smile he has on his face. But that could land both of us in jail. We don't want to do that. So what do I do? I put a mock object instead of his payment processing system. I can ask the mock object to behave, but I can ask the mock object to misbehave. It can fail. And I can run the test, and my code says, oops, this doesn't respond now. Here's how I'm going to handle it. And I can ensure that I'm handling it gracefully. Make sense? So mock objects can not only simulate behavior, they can simulate ill behavior. And based on that, we can ensure our code is behaving in a consistent way and handle things gracefully. All right, enough talking. Let's give this all a try. So I'm going to create a very simple, dumb example here for us to understand how this all this can work. So what I'm going to do here, like I said, I'm going to create a very simple example here. And what I'm going to do is simply create a, a file monitoring class. So what is my file monitor going to do? My file monitor says, monitor the file system. Tell me when this font is big enough for the people in the top row, if you will. Is that big enough? Yes. This, this here? Yes. Or do you want it bigger than that? That's fine. That's fine? OK. Anytime you think it's got to be bigger, just tell me, OK? All right. So I've got a file monitoring class. And what is it going to do? I want it to check if the file changes on the file system. If it does, I want it to raise an alarm. Fair enough? Very little small code. I'm not going to create a monster here. Just a little example. So here's a thought about testing. If you tell me what you think of this idea. I'm going to write my code. I'm going to run it. And my code is waiting for the file system to change. Then I go to the file system. I add a file. And the alarm is going to raise. And I'll hear it. Yep, my code is working. What do you think? Would that work? Is it a good way to test the code? It's one way to test the code. Is it one way to test the code? Is it a fair way to test the code? Is it a fair way to test the code? Why is it not a fair way to test the code? It's not fast. It's not automatable, right? At least two ways. Why is it not fast? Because I'm in what? I'm slow. Why is it not automated? Because it's manual. So it's not a fair way to test the code, right? OK, here's an idea. I'm going to have a little program that modifies the file system. I'm going to have a decibel meter that's going to measure the audio and say, oops, look at that. I measured the audio. There was an alarm. Feeds back into my program. That's repeatable. What do you think? Any great idea? It looks complicated. Your company just sends an invoice for a million dollars. <laughs> hey, what is that for? To automate my test cases? Reject it. No more testing for you. Right? So that looks too complicated, right? You don't want to do that. So what do you do? How about mocking out the alarm and mocking out the file system? With those two mocked away, we can test our code and it'll be pretty fair. Fast, automated, repeatable, and isolated. Let's do that. So help me out here. So here is a test class I'm going to start with. So I say file monitor test. What am I going to do here? I'm going to write my first test. My first test here says, Test alarm raised. Very simple, right? Just write a test, alarm raised. What am I going to do? File monitor, monitor equals new file monitor. So I create a file monitor. And what are the two things the file monitor needs? File system and alarm. So file system and alarm. Let's say file system and alarm. Making sense? Not a long one, a long So those are the two things I need, right? So let's get this to working. What is this going to be? I file system, file system equals null to begin with. And I'm also going to say I alarm, alarm equals null. You're happy with me so far? Yeah. Nothing complicated, right? I'm just writing this together. So I need a file system monitor. Let's go ahead and create that one. So I'm saying, hey, go create that class for uh, method for me. So he goes, creates that for you. If you go to this class, right there is our beautiful file system constructor sitting there. 
with a to-do comment, and it says, I filled in those two for you. I'm not gonna get picky on the convention here. That's done. Studio did all that for you, right? Cool. So let's go back over here to the test. Okay, we got the file system monitor up here, but notice one thing, the file monitor knows about the IE file system, which is an interface. Should, do you think the file monitor should know about the mock? Not at all, no. It should only know the interface. Mock is the little secret between you, me, and the test, right? Never tell the class it's using a mock. So it only knows the interface, all right. So what am I gonna do here? I go back to this class and say, okay, now we are cool. I'm gonna say, first, no alarm. Then I'm gonna say simulate, simulate change, then yes alarm. That's all you want, right? Am I making sense? So that's all you're trying to do. Okay, how do I know there's no alarm? Will the real alarm tell you that there was an alarm or not? Not really. The real alarm just blares. But who can tell you whether there was an alarm or not? The mock can see, right? So the test will use a mock, the real code will use an interface, it doesn't know it's using a mock, but you send a mock to him, right? It's a complete plot. Okay, so what am I gonna do here? I go back here to say, hey, file system mock is what I wanna create, equals file system equals new file system mock. With me? But notice I am creating a mock in the test, but the real code doesn't know it's a mock. It still has a reference to the interface. And if you look at the file system mock itself, notice that this particular mock implements the file i file system. So he's all good, right? He says, I'm ready for helping you. That's not a problem. So now what I'm going to do here is to, now that I've created that, in a similar way, I'm going to create an alarm mock over here and then go to this guy and say alarm equals new alarm mock. So there we go, we create the alarm mock also. So now what I'm gonna do is to see if there was an alarm, how do I do that? Assert false alarm dot raised. Happy? And it better say no, because no alarm was raised. Cool. I'm gonna simulate file change. Again, a real file system will not let you do that. But a mock can help you do that, remember? So file system dot simulate change, which is just a function on the mock, not on the interface. Yes? Yeah. Please? Uh, why would you actually want to do that? I was thinking that you don't say simulate change, you actually perform the real operation. But I can't, because if I perform the real operation, then I need the real file system. No, it should be mock, of course. The interface should be the interface is real. Yeah, so what would happen is that since the file system mock implements the interface, I probably think it will be I file system, file system equals new or file system mock, and I alarm mock, I alarm, alarm is equal to new or alarm mock. Right, so, so think about it this way. The file, sys the file monitor doesn't know anything about the mock. Agree? Mm -hmm. It doesn't know anything about the mock. So what does the file mo the monitor do? The monitor says, I got a file system here, I don't know what the implementation is. I'm going to keep asking him, hey, have you changed? Have you changed? Have you changed? Right? But we know it's a mock behind the scene. If it was a real file system, it would say, yep, it was changed because the user changed the file. The mock is just going to give a light to it. Fair enough? So, yep. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back here. And I haven't finished this yet. So, what about the yes mock? I'm going to go back here and say, oh, assert true is true, and I'm gonna say alarm dot raised. Happy with that? Yes, right. Well, but of course we gotta to talk to the monitor, we haven't done that. So monitor dot observe, observe. What do I observe? The C temp directory. Some directory you gotta tell him what to observe, right? Okay with this so far? So the only thing we gotta do is to implement the beautiful observe method, let's do that. So I'm gonna implement the observe method, I go back to the code, here is my observe method, and let's make that observe method public, and let's go ahead and implement the observe method. So what am I gonna do in the observe method? Well, here's the deal. File system dot set path to observe the path that's given to me, which is right here. Happy? So we tell him what path to observe, and then what do we do? Now that we tell him what path to observe, we're gonna say, okay, while it's true, 
Because I want to keep doing this over and over and over, right? While it's true, if file system dot has, uh, sorry, oh, yeah, has changed, oops, changed, then what do I do? Alarm dot race. And now that it's done, I'm going to say thread dot sleep for a second and repeat. That's my code, right? Very simple so far, right? Yeah. Nothing really complicated. Uh, alarm dot race is a function I'm going to call. I'm not really doing anything complex, right? So what does this code do? It says I'm going to set the path to observe to the file system. I'm going to continuously check. Have you changed? Raise the alarm. Sleep. Have you changed? Raise the alarm. Sleep. That's all it's doing, right? We're good. Let's go ahead and run this code. So save that away. Let's go back to the test and run the test. And I'm using n unit here to run it. So here's n unit. Click on it. And the great news is it says running. You see that? It says running. So right there, it says running. So why don't you all go have a nice break, get some coffee or something. And then when it's done, we'll check it out. What do you think? How long it's going to run? Forever. Forever. Why is it going to run forever? Because that's not a while loop. That's a wild loop. It got, it's gone wild. It's never going to terminate, right? And he's like, Venkat, I told you before you came here, that's why we don't do unit testing. Right? This doesn't work. That's why, you know, we are wise. We avoid this problem at the root. We don't do this stuff at work. We don't have time for it. We've got deadlines. Right? And the boss is like, are you done yet? Hmm. How do we solve the problem? You know what the problem is? The test is calling this code, and the code is in this wild loop. And the test is like, dude, are you done? The code is like your boss now. Are you done? Are you done? And this guy's like, wait, I'm still at work. Any ideas? Come on, somebody's got to help me. What can you do? So you heard the word synchronous. Did I hear that? So you're saying to create a thread? Yeah? Create a thread? Thread, thread? OK, let's create a thread. So who said, who said that? Yeah. How nice. I like him. He, look at him. Point the finger. Do you work with him? No. Thank goodness. If, you, if he ever comes for an interview, stop him at the door. Let's talk. OK. OK, so new thread, delegate. So we got a delegate running here. When we are done dot start, we start this new thread. So what are we going to do here? We're going to start this new thread, all right. But within the thread, we're going to run this piece of code that we just created here, right? So let's just go ahead and move that within the delegate. Happy? So we put that into a thread. Let's go back and try this. So we go back to the test. We say, go run this test for me. And then when it starts up, click. We got a good news. What's the good news? The test finished. What's the bad news? Right? Well, was the operation really successful? I mean, I don't know, but we got the bullet out, right? Okay. So why did it fail? Well, actually, yeah, kind of. What what really happened here was we never gave him time. We just simulate change. Hey, is it true? And it's like, hey, wait, you just told me to simulate change. You didn't give me time. Okay, here's an idea. Thread dot sleep. Now run the test. Woohoo! What do you think? He's calling his boss. I like it. He's like, boss, I just figured out how to be on schedule and do unit testing. Look at the excitement he has. Right? He has to call right away and say, boss, I got news for you. Great. What's what's good about this or bad about this? What do you think? It's not reliable. 
You look like you're sitting on the phone. <laughs> I thought, look, he was asking. Yeah, I saw this story. Is it reliable? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't like it. It's not reliable. He's right. Why? There's a race condition, right? You keep running this thousand times, it will fail once. It's like, oops, it failed. Your colleague is like, really? It failed? Yeah, look at the red bar. Hmm. Run it again? What does it do? Passes. It makes a lie out of you. Your friend is like, you kidding me. No, I'm serious. It failed. Run it again. It doesn't. Okay, I'll get a cup of coffee and try it again. He leaves, it fails. <laughs> That's not a good test. It's unreliable. That's one good point, right? What else is the problem with this? That's right. I like you guys. It is slow. Like you're waiting for, like, oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> so it's slow. Imagine you have. 3,000 tests. And each of the 3,000 tests take one second to run. How long is that? Very long. Don't give me a number. One day is like 20 minutes. How do you know? Why do you know it's 20 minutes? You shouldn't use your brain for that thing. It's very long. That's all you need to know. And if it's very long, what happens? It's not fair. Because it's not fast. OK, we know what problem with this code. How do we fix it? Hmm. Go back to this culprit here. It's a while in the loop still. And we put a thread. That still didn't solve the problem. Well, synchronize won't help you here. Problem is not a synchronization problem. OK. So the problem is this. What is unit testing? I'll give you a smart answer. It is a test on a unit of code. How about that? Right? You'll get jobs by this answer in the interviews, right? OK. OK, smart. But what is a unit then? So here's my answer for what a unit is. A unit is a smallest piece of code that does useful work. A unit is not a class. A unit is not a method. A unit is the smallest piece of code that does useful work. What about properties in, in C sharp? You know properties, right? Yes. What do the properties do? The return of value, are they set? Are they smallest? Yes. Yeah. Are they useful? Yes. Nah. What do they do? They do nothing. They just set the value and they give you the value back, right? You could do more interesting stuff. You could do more, but do they? Most of them, no. In fact, you know because in by default, you could simply say property, curly bracket, get semicolon, set semicolon, right? So they don't do a whole lot. I, it's like the guy I ran at the airport. I said, what do you do? He said, well, I help my dad in the village. That's noble of you. What does your dad do? Nothing. <laughs> OK? So the property sounds like that, right? So that's great. OK? So that's why you shouldn't write unit tests on properties. Because they are smallest piece of useless code. What about this function we wrote? Is that useful? Yeah, we are spending time on it. But is it the smallest piece of code? Separate the credit card and the Now he wants to stop now. OK, yes. So yeah, we can separate this into smaller pieces. We can refactor this into smaller pieces. So the point is, it's not a smallest piece of code. So as a result, it is not a unit. We're barking at the wrong tree. It's not a unit of code. That's why it's not unit testable. So what do we need to do for it to be unit testable? Divide and conquer. Break it into smaller pieces. Make sense? So we need to really make code smaller for us to be able to unit test. That's very critical. So let's do that. So notice what I'm going to do now. I'm going to simply take this piece of code. And what am I going to do? I'm going to refactor this. I'm not going to change the test right now. I'm going to come back and fix the test. But I'm going to take this piece of code. And what am I going to do? I'm going to say, hey, convert that for me into a small method. What method? Set path to observe. I'm going to give the same name. So I may move that to a set path to observe. And that method is marked as private, but I'm going to mark it as internal. <coughs> All right, I'm going to mark it as internal. 
Then I'm going to go back over here, and here is the next piece of code I'm interested in. These two lines, I'm going to grab that part, and I'm going to refactor that, and I'm going to say check file system and raise alarm. And now that's again marked as a private method, I'm going to mark it as internal. Why do I mark things as internal? Because private methods are private. I cannot test them. But if it's an internal, I could reach in. We'll try, try doing that a little later. Okay, that's cool. We refactored it. I'm going to run this broken test. It's broken still, but I'm going to run it still and see if it works. So I'm going to run this test this time again. So here's my test. Run it. And it still seems to work with all the problems it had before. Now it's time for us to refactor this and go ahead and use the actual methods. But before I do this, I've got a small problem. If you notice here in my directory structure, I've got one library called file monitor lib and another library called file monitor test lib. Here's a quiz for you. Can I access internal functions of one assembly from another assembly? No, not really. Unless you get what? Friend. Yeah, you're right. So what am I going to do? I say over here, internal visible two. There's a back door, right? So I say internal visible two. File monitor test lib. So this library says, you know what, my internal is mine, but that guy is my friend. He gets key to my house. Right? So, so far so good? So now I can call internal stuff by marking it internal visible too. All right, so far so good. So now I'm going to go back over here, and I'm going to say not a call to the monitor observe. I'm going to first say monitor dot check file system and raise alarm. But before I do this, I'm going to say monitor dot set path to observe. And then what am I going to do? See if the alarm is raised. It's not. Simulate change. And what am I going to do? Monitor dot. That's right. Check file system and raise alarm. And this time it better raise the alarm. Go ahead and try that. So run the test. Did you notice it was fast? Yes. It was repeatable. Right? I can run this any number of times. There's no more surprises. I got a few more things to show you. What do you think? Should you probably be mixing Freddy into unit Tomorrow night. I'm going to give a talk in the Agile Bangalore group where I'm going to spend my time only on multi-threading issues with unit testing. But the real summary is you should never use thread to test multi-thread code. That's a path of destruction. Unless your company gives you free pizza, then you want to stay behind in the night and fix that messy green. But if you have a family and want to go home, don't do that. <laughs> right? So you should never use thread to test multi-threaded code. It's a mess. So what I mean to say is that even inside your test code, uh -huh. uh, you actually mix testing. I mean, threads inside. We did not. Not in this case. So here, you don't go there. We actually simulate the creation of the thread in the first place. If you have removed the whole concept of the No. Thread. You don't want to simulate creation of a thread because that becomes very expensive. So what you want to do is to completely avoid threading, yeah, right? avoid threading. and then test your logic. That's your unit test. Exactly. Then run your integration yeah. test to run with the thread. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's not a unit test. That's an integration test. Right? Separate those two out. Unit test focuses on unit of code, integration on functional tests. That's a topic for another day. Right? They can deal with it. Any other questions? So far, so good, right? Let's write one more test. Right? So what's, what have we learned so far? <laughs> okay, make the method small and run a unit test on them. They got to be very small and useful. Very good. What else? Using mocks. You could use nmock, rhino mock, and all those frameworks. 
but I'm a believer in doing things simple, learning them, then you go use the framework, right? If you don't know how to use a framework, you don't know what a mock is, you end up creating a mess. You learn a mock, you hand toss, you play with it, hey, that looks interesting, I, can, I know what's happening, but I can save time by using a framework, bam, you go use a framework. I use a framework once I know what I'm doing. I'm not a fan of saying, click, 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 it works, I don't have a clue what it does. That's a very dangerous situation to be in, right? So you never want to do stuff where you say, it works, but I don't know why it works. I'm sure you work with people like that, right? There's like, are you done? Yes. What did you do? I don't know, but it works. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. So we need to understand what's going on. That's very important. All right. Next test. What I want to write here is test invalid path. So what am I going to do in this test invalid path? File monitor, monitor equals new file monitor. So we created this. File system, comma, null. I don't need an alarm. We're not going to get that far. So I file system, file system equals null to begin with. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to say monitor dot set path to observe, and I'm going to give him invalid path. So tell me what this code should do when you give him invalid path. Uh, throw an exception, he says. So try, and I'm going to throw an exception here. So catch file system monitor exception. And if the exception happens, is that good or bad? That's good. So I usually put a smiley to say, yep, this is good. I don't like to put an empty catch block. Anytime I see an empty catch block, I get nervous. Maybe this programmer didn't know what he was doing. If you don't want a smiley, or if you want a smiley in addition, you could say assert is true, true, just to put an executable code. But that's not enough, right? You also want to know assert.fail. Why? Because if the exception was not thrown, you want this to blow up. So you say expected exception for uh, what? Invalid path. All right? So far, so good, right? I go ahead and run this. What does it do? It fails. With what? It fails with what exception? So it says something over here. I don't know what it says here. Let's see. So the test failed in line number 43. What's the result over here? Let's look at the output it gave us. Um, not a good output. I'm looking for what the real message was. Let's see if this says something. So, um, oh, there it is. And it tells us object reference not set. Null reference exception. Makes sense, right? I just want to make sure it's doing the right thing. Why is it a null reference exception? Because of this null. So I'm going to say new, oops, new file system mock. Run the test one more time. So here we go. Run the test. It failed again. What happened this time? It's going to the fail. Why? Because that code never threw the exception. So I got an idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the file system mock over here. I'll go to this mock. And what I'm going to do in this mock is I'm going to change this set path to observe to throw the exception. What do you think? Well, and, uh, yeah, that too, right? But here I'm going to throw the exception. Why? Because my file monitor says I'm going to uh, you know, check for this condition. So it says try over here. And it says uh, catch IO exception. If it's an IO exception, it's going to say throw, uh, throw new file system monitor, file monitor exception. So I've done this change. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go to this mock and say, throw new IO exception. What do you think of that idea? Why is it a bad idea? It's a bad idea because that will break the first test. Would you agree? It breaks the first test. What happens if it breaks the first test? Fair. Isolation is broken. So here's an idea. I'm going to take the mock and put a flag in it. He's like, I don't like it. Why don't you like it? Why? Well, I don't like care whether it's a way to 
it as not. Why is not that not a good idea? Don't tell me how to fix it, but I'm asking you what the problem with that is. What's wrong with putting a flag? Huh? The mark is getting a little bit complex. Right? The mark is getting a little bit complex. You got logic in the mark. So who's the actor you said? Amir Khan. Amir Khan, did you say? So you got this guy who's just about his size, right? And he, you've been using him as a mark. And a few weeks goes by, he says, excuse me, can I have some salary and benefits? <laughs> right? Now you've got to support this guy. I mean, he doesn't show up on time anymore. Now that he's employed, right? We know how that goes, right? You, when you were volunteering, you were on time, they hired you. Once in a while, you show up to work, right? Yeah. So, the mark just became, became complex. So let's assume that you went and put this little flag. One day you get this frightening question from your colleague. What's the frightening question? Your colleague says, excuse me, do we need to unit test the mark? You know you've gone really wrong with this, right? Okay. So what do we do? The point is, we want to keep these tests isolated from each other, but you want the marks to be isolated. How does that work? So let's see, what's your name? What was that? Mithrae. So we want to test your character as a human, right? We're going to see how good a human he is. Anybody who works with him? See, okay, this is an easy. Okay. So we want to test how good a human he is. So how do we do it? What's your name? They call him what? Jackie. But what is your name? I don't care okay, what they call you as. Jackie. Okay. Is it okay to call you Jackie now or should I call you Jackie? Jackie Rukish. What does your mom call you? <laughs> okay. All right. So it's Jackie, right? So what we're going to do is, Mitreya? Mitresh. So here it's, I'm going to send a text to Mitresh. And the text is going to read, there's fire in the building. But you know what he's going to do? If he's a good guy, what does he do? He tells JK, hey, look, there's a fire in the building, you better get out. That's what he would do if he's a good human being, right? If he's a bad human being, what does he do? He runs away. And then JK is like, what did I do to him? Right? That's not good, right? So, but if I really send him a text and if he screams to JK, what happens? JK is going to scream and everybody's going to run out of the building and that's no fun. So what are we going to do? So here's what we're going to do. I'm sorry, JK. This is your mark. All right? But look at him. He looks so complex. He's got emotions. I look at this laugh he has. He's got other things. What languages do you program? All these things he knows, right? That is so much for me to capture. And I cannot really create a mark with all those details. But do I need to? Not really. Because all this mark needs to say is what? What was it? All that this mark needs to say what? That our friend Mithraya sent a message or not, correct? That's all we care about. Hey, did you get a message? Yeah, I did. He's a nice human. Fair enough? Now I'm going to send a different text message to him. I'm going to tell him, in the next room, there is Alba. But only one piece left. As a smart man, what will he do? He wouldn't announce the word. Hey, there's only one. I mean, that's the wrong thing to do. He quietly slips over. Because he's a man of priority. Gets it, right? Then I go to the market and say, did you get a message? What does it say? What message? It's like, okay, the man has good priority, right? So, all that I need for a mark is just look at a thin slice of behavior. We don't care to mark the object, we care to mark what? What was that? Not behavior, one more, I word. Interaction. Interaction. The interaction between them is all that I care about, right? We just mark the interaction. Hey, did you get the message? Yeah, I did. Okay, he worked properly. Did you get the message? No, I didn't. Okay, then his practice is all right. So we don't care to mark an object. We care to mark just a thin slice of interaction. Am I making sense? So notice what I'm going to do here. I simply go back here and say, file system mark invalid path. So I'm creating a mark for just this part here. 
file system invalid path is a separate class I create. And what am I going to do here? I'm going to create this as, oh, where am I? I'm in the wrong place, I think. Did I put it in the wrong place? Yes, I did. So pardon me here. So let's go to this test, the second test that we are interested in, right? This is the one. So I'm going to change this one here to file system mark invalid path. But I don't need to go create a class separately. I'm going to create a, what's this called? Nested class. That's a term we use in C sharp, right? Nested class. So we create this, and that implements the iFile system. And all, oh, you know what? Even better. I'm going to just extend what? That way I don't have to put those other stupid methods, right? I don't care about. So I'm going to just overwrite this over here. Oh, but for overriding this, I better go to the mark and make this method as? Bingo, you guys are good. So I make that virtual. So I go to this class over here, and what do I do? Override, and I'm going to simply override, set path to observe. And over here, what am I going to do? Throw new system.io system exception, eh, IO exception. So now we go run the test, and both the tests pass. So what did we do? We kept it isolated. We create tests so that the test simply focuses on one slice of interaction. We don't deal with the complexity of this object. We just simply care about this interaction. So marking can save us a lot of time because it gives us a quick feedback. How does it help? Because it helps us to be able to write the unit test. What does a unit test do? A unit test gives us a better design of the code. It gives us a better documentation of the code. It also gives us a safety net when it comes to refactoring. Have you ever changed a piece of code and has it ever broken? All the time. All the time, right? Every time I touch the code, I break it. But you know what? If your code sucks, would you want your computer to tell you your code sucks or your coworker to tell you your code sucks? Computer, right? Then your coworker is like, he's a great programmer. Because the unit test says you suck, and your worker says he rocks. That's what you want. So unit tests make you a better programmer than you really are. Who wants that? Which is better? It's an integration test or unit test? Both. Both. Because it's a different cycle of feedback. How is that? Think about that for a minute. If you are writing a piece of code, and I got a unit test on it. And I got a piece of code here that's using your code. And I got some integration test. Well, tell me, last time you found a bug and fixed it, did it take more time to find the bug or to fix it? Find the bug, right? You take a long time to find the bug, and then you say, huh, and then you fix it. So if you can save the time you take to find the bug, you can fix it quickly. So how does it help? Stay with me. So here's a piece of code. You run your unit tests, and all your unit tests pass. You run all your unit tests, all of them pass. Life is good. You make one change. Your unit test breaks. Where's the problem? In your code. Oh, we fix it. Your unit test pass, but your integration test fail. Where's the problem? Not in your code. It's in the code that uses your code, or the code you use, or an interaction between them. So it gives you the isolation. That's why I like both of them. Go ahead, if you have questions. Yeah, last way to do it, uh, the fact that you keep on writing more and more code, there's a good chance that you can see the bug. You can, can do what? See the bug in it. In, in what? In the test or in the code? If you write more code. Not just, but more code. Yeah, yeah. Just write this more reduces code. the code, by the way. Why? Because you're lazy to write more tests on code, you don't need to write. This is a bit of a practical challenge where I have seen that the mock itself is huge. Is it possible to write back code? Yes. It's possible to write back test? Yes. So if you write back test, fix it. To a long, to a long extent, when you have a lot of tests that are being written. No, no, stop right there. It is not OK to write back code. It is not okay to write that test. So what we do is, on our projects, 
we do fairly extensive programs. We will write so for half a day. Oh, by the way, we don't bring the room of C to do code reviews. That's a bad idea, right? The boss freaks out. What you do is you write code for a half a day, and you give it to him. And say, hey, go review this. The next half a day you write code, you give it to her to review, right? We do tactical code reviews. And not only do we review code, we also review test cases. So we make sure the code is of good quality and the test is of good quality. And as a he's like, one minute, stop talking, okay, I'll try. Mm -hmm. So um, I love his persistence. He moves around. I'm trying to avoid him. <laughs> and he's like, I'm not over here. I like him. This is great. So, so we make sure that the test is of good quality as well. And you know, yes, it is quite possible that everything is brittle, but we have to make sure that things are of good quality, right? Just like how we can write bad code, we can write bad test also. But we've got to write more towards me. Any other questions? We create a separate solution for a test. Do we create a separate solution for a test? Uh, what I do is I create a blank solution always. Then I bring in projects into my blank solution. So as a result, I usually create a library for a piece of code, and I create a separate library for the test. And I do them in pairs. Why? That way I can easily decide, I don't release that assembly. Right? It becomes a deployment piece. I don't have to mess with it. If I put them all together, it's a bit more work. But here it's like, eh, no, no, any assembly that's in with the name test, don't ship it. So that's the reason I keep them separate. And the fact that I can use internal visible too eliminates the problem of where they are. So that's that's my personal preference. I keep them separate for that reason. That's all I have. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let's take the question right after. Thank you.